Good afternoon and welcome to the liftoff webinar. My name is Christine Longroy, Senior Director of Ecosystem for Lyft. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today we have the great pleasure of uh, having Questec present today, Gary Whalen, who's a C Senior Materials Design Engineer. And he is going to be presenting the applications of microstructure sensitive fatigue modeling. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Gary's background. He is a senior materials design engineer at Questec and has experience utilizing ICME to model process structure property relationships for metal alloys of various materials. For example, steel, aluminum, nickel, titanium, and for various industries, aerospace, oil, gas, medical, automotive, all of which I'm sure is um, participating in this presentation today. So Gary, you're gonna be in great hands with our audience. So as I said, he's gonna be talking about the applications of microstructure sensitive fatigue modeling. Let me tell you about a little bit of um, about Questec for those of the, you that do not know. Um, Questec is both a pioneer and a mark, current market leader in the integrated computational materials engineering, leveraging technologies proven to reduce the development time, cost, and to increase the performance novel models. And at the end of the presentation, Gary is going to be prepared to answer those questions. Um, so please use the uh, questions chat feature and he will be prepared to answer the questions. So thanks for joining us today and Gary, take it away. Welcome to Liftoff Webinars, brought to you by Lyft, the National Advanced Material Manufacturing Innovation Institute, where we drive American manufacturing into the future through technology and talent development. Lyft is a public-private partnership where we convene and connect government, industry, and academia in the fields of advanced materials, manufacturing processes, systems engineering to enhance America's manufacturing competitiveness, national economy, and national security. All right, hello and thank you all for joining my webinar today. My name is Gary Whalen. I'm a senior material design engineer here at Questec. And today I'm going to talk to you about how uh, integrated computational materials engineering or ICME can be used to model and predict microstructure sensitive fatigue. So I'll start with a brief introduction to Questec uh, and then get into the motivation of this talk. Following that, I'll go through the background details of how Questec approaches fatigue modeling, starting with multi-stage fatigue, and then generation of microstructure digital twins. Then I'll talk about how we use machine learning to accelerate this, this simulation approach, and in turn, scale to component scale applications. Finally, I'll talk about some real applications of this type of modeling, uh, with a couple of example use cases where it's been used and validated experimentally. And then I'll close by talking about Questec's ICMD software platform and how we're bringing all of these modeling tools uh, to bear into a user-friendly framework to bring it to your heads. So Questec is a small business uh, focused on empowering innovators to resolve materials challenges. Questec uh, is primarily located in Evanston, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Uh, with additional offices in Sweden to service uh, European clients, as well as Tokyo to service Japanese clients, uh, and a small office in the Cambridge area near MIT. Questec's been around since 1997, uh, and we have a team of about 45 folks here in Chicago uh, with over 20 PhDs on staff. We've developed uh, over 33 patents and serviced over 400 government contracts, as well as over 200 corporate engagements. And we've really claimed for the first ever flight approved cyber steel, which is the first alloy ever generated purely with an ICME approach to actually be approved for uh, flight with the Air Force. Questec services many different government uh, bodies, including DARPA, ONR, uh, the DOE, NASA, as well as uh, many different industries, including automotive, aerospace, um, the agricultural industry, and biomedical. We've had quite a few client successes over the years, uh, but one, one good example of that is the development of the Barium M54 hook shank. This is a material that Questec developed clean sheet using an ICME approach and was cited in the NIST report 
uh, for the Material Genome Initiative as a success uh, in 2011, or rather in 2018. Um, this application uh, is for the, the hook shank at the back of this aircraft that you can see on the slide here, which ca catches the wire uh, to stop these aircrafts very quickly on aircraft carriers. So as you can imagine, this is a very intense application. And using our modeling approach, we managed to design a novel alloy that could handle these very difficult applications uh, in about half the time of traditional experimental approaches. So now we get into some of the motivation as to why we care so much about fatigue in the context of material science uh, and integrated computational materials engineering. Fatigue is ubiquitous in engineering applications, ranging across aerospace, defense, biomedical, energy, and automotive, just to name a few industries. Both high cycle fatigue for gears and helicopter, uh, helicopters, cars, or hip implants uh, that see loading cycles for every single step that you take, or a low cycle fatigue for something like a landing gear that's only loaded once per flight. Um, these are both aspects of fatigue that uh, need to be bundled differently, but ultimately drive the performance of engineering alloys um, and are important considerations for engineers in the design, qualification, and sustainment of their products. Looking at the literature, it becomes clear that across many industries, fatigue remains the number one cause of failures. From airframes and helicopters citing 55% of all failures being a result of fatigue, to automotive citing 90% of all mechanical service failures being a result of fatigue. This trend continues across many other industries where there are a large portion of applications that are limited by fatigue. In recent years, this has only become more critical in the light of new manufacturing techniques and innovative designs pushing the limits of materials performance. The standard approach to understanding fatigue in engineering materials is to qualify materials, processes, and components following the traditional pyramid of pain here on the right side of the slide. Typically, hundreds to thousands of tests are done at the components of the coupon scale to determine design allowables. So that's the bottom of the pyramid here where you're testing individual tensile of coupons. Then scaling up to elements, details, components, and ultimately full flight systems testing. This approach is obviously very costly and time consuming, particularly for fatigue, where you have to run tests for hours and days as opposed to tensile properties, which are much more straightforward to test. Additionally, even though once we do, even once we do all of this testing rather, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. Fatigue lives can vary substantially in ostensibly the same material at the same loading condition. And to generate a full SN curve, showing you your minimum fatigue performance at various loading conditions for various manufacturing and processes, as well as uh, different boundary conditions like the temperature of your application, this just becomes impractical. For an MMPDS A basis allowable, which is the standard for aerospace applications for um, structural components. The, for tensile properties, you need to run between 100 to 300 tensile tests to determine your 1% minimum tensile strength with 95% certainty. For fatigue, this would be equivalent to running 100, 100 tests at each of the scenarios across uh, different loading scenarios, different temperatures, different processes, resulting in thousands of fatigue tests each of which can be an order of magnitude more expensive and several orders of magnitude slower than a tensile test. As a result, the status quo is to make compromises. We make best efforts to predict minimum fatigue property, for, uh, minimum fatigue performance, uh, and then we take a damage tolerance approach, whereby we inspect parts, uh, we inspect parts um, in service to determine if a crack is initiated, and if so, how much longer the service life can be. This approach works, uh, but it does have limitations. Particularly for high cycle fatigue, the majority of fatigue life is consumed in just initiating the crack at the microstructural scale, which is not well captured by non-destructive evaluation. Additionally, inspection is expensive and time consuming, and we can't inspect everything. For example, internal surfaces and complex systems cannot always be inspected. As such, uh, this approach results in um, low certainty, necess necessitating 
very high safety factors, uh, which reduce performance inherently. Further compounding the limitations of the current approaches, there are new manufacturing techniques like additive manufacturing, which bring along a lot of advantages, including supply chain resilience, domestic manufacturing, and improved performance. However, they also bring along a lot of complexities in terms of the microstructures that we're dealing with. A lot of these complexities, like porosity, lack of fusion, elongated grains, and complex crystallographic textures leading to anisotropic material properties, as can be seen on the bottom right side of this slide, uh, result in major variability in fatigue life. The figure on the top right side of the slide uh, shows a fatigue life curve for ROT TIE 6 4 versus laser powder bed fusion additively manufactured TIE 6 4. This material is a workhorse in aerospace, biomedical, and many other fatigue critical applications. We can see that in, uh, in its printed state, the fatigue life can have an order of magnitude lower performance than in the rot state. This is a result of microstructure and defects. Without accounting for microstructure and defects, we cannot predict the fatigue performance of printed components. And moreover, we cannot focus on the right things to improve fatigue performance for future designs of both process and material. So with that, I'm going to talk about how Questech approaches fatigue modeling, accounting for various time and length scales and the influences of microstructure. Fatigue in general is a multi-stage process, starting with crack incubation at the subgrain scale and transitioning to microstructurally small crack growth, where cracks can grow along seemingly erratic paths through the first three to 10 grains, as they follow the path of least resistance and are highly influenced by microstructure features. Until finally, once the crack is long enough, the plastic zone at the tip of the crack is sampling enough, uh, enough grains that their individual effects average out. And we get to physically long crack growth, which is dominated by linear elastic pressure mechanics. To start with, at the subgrain level, crack incubation can occur within one grain due to the accumulation of slip, or in other words, dislocations in a crystal structure, which move under loading. Uh, as, the, and as the cyclic loading continues, they accumulate at areas where there are barriers to slip like grain boundaries or defects like inclusions or pores. This is especially important when we are considering very high cycle fatigue. For applications, a component will be exposed to millions of cycles, like a heart valve replacement, for example, which beats 60 times per minute for a few decades. Um, in the very high cycle fatigue regime, the vast majority of fatigue life is spent in a crack incubation stage. So modeling the stage is by far the most important aspect of predicting very high cycle fatigue. The way we do this is by simulating cyclic loading on a microstructure using crystal plasticity finite element method, or CPFE. Here you can see an example of a statistical volume element, or a representative volume element, as it's sometimes called, or often referred to as an RVE. This is a sub uh, section of material, making up uh, somewhere between 100 to 1,000 grains typically. That represents a statistically digital twin of the microstructure. Using finite element method, we simulate loading cycles, as you can see here, where we apply strain cyclically for a number of cycles, and the results uh, are a cyclic stress strain curve. We don't want to simulate the entire life as it would be too computationally expensive and take millions of uh, computational hours to simulate every cycle. But rather, we simulate somewhere on the order of three to 10 cycles until we see plastic and elastic shakedown, and we have a stable cyclic stress strain response. So if you look at these uh, stress strain curves here, you can see that the first cycle is a little bit different and then as you go along, the stress strain curve becomes consistent. At that point, we predict what is called a fatigue indicator parameter at all points across the microstructure. You can also see on this slide the potemic soci fatigue indicator parameter equation, which can be used to predict fatigue driving forces based on the cyclic plastic shear strain range. <clears throat> 
In other words, the plastic strain at the peak uh, in tension during the cyclic loading minus the plastic strain at the peak compression along different slip planes within a crystal are uh, combined with the stress normal to those slip planes. And ultimately, uh, this pr produces a metric which can account for the um, likelihood of a crack incubating at the subgrain level. Finally, by calculating this across the microstructure, we can find local hotspots where fatigue crack initiate, and we can quantify the driving forces to compare very high cycle fatigue life in different materials or under different loading scenarios. Next, we model microstructurally small crack growth using a similar approach. So now, instead of looking at the highest fatigue indicator parameter in a microstructure, we care about all of the fatigue indicator parameters in the neighborhood. So you can see here that we simulate uh, ensembles of statistical volume elements, and we characterize extreme value distributions of those fatigue indicator parameters. This helps us understand the fatigue performance in a material. We then use a non-deterministic approach to fatigue crack growth, where we simulate the crack growing outward from the initial grain in all directions. In this case, you can see an example of a 2D crack growing from the first grain and then to the second nearest neighbors and then finally the third nearest neighbors. Well, in practice, we do this in three dimensions. Uh, and basically, we by simulating all of these different paths, we can then determine the path of least resistance to determine the minimum fatigue life. This microstructurally small crack stage is especially important in moderate to high cycle fatigue in the ballpark of around 100,000 seconds. Lastly, long crack growth occurs when cracks um, grow beyond the stage where the plastic zone at the end of the crack is averaging out enough grains to no longer be driven by local microstructural phenomenon. For this, we utilize linear elastic fracture mechanics as it is an effective way to characterize the fatigue cracks once they have reached this critical length. Here on the slide, you can see a modified NASGRO equation, which utilizes the stress intensity factor to predict long crack growth. And below, you can see an example where we can calibrate this model with experimental data. On the right side is a schematic showing how all three regimes of fatigue crack growth merge together. So essentially, a fatigue crack initiates in the first grain and then grows sporadically through the first handful of grains slowly as it approaches barriers and then faster as it goes through the grain. And after a number of cycles, it begins to converge to a Paris law as we get more consistent fatigue crack growth in the long crack regime. All three of these stages are important in both low cycle fatigue and high cycle fatigue, but generally speaking, Initiation is dominant in the high cycle fatigue life regime, while long crack growth is dominant in the low cycle fatigue life regime. Now I'm going to delve a little deeper uh, on our microstructure sensitive fatigue modeling approach. Our crystal plasticity based fatigue, uh, fatigue crack initiation model can be seen here, where we can capture inputs like microstructure features such as grain size, phase fraction, precipitates, and grain orientation as well as extrinsic features like surface roughness or porosity and inclusions, which are especially important in additive manufacturing. We then generate a digital twin of the microstructure. Here you can see an example of a cube of material where we are highlighting two inclusions. This crystal plasticity model can be calibrated with cyclic stress training data. And then from this, we can predict the fatigue indicator parameters that I've described before which can help us compare competing microstructures or loading scenarios to understand and optimize for fatigue. Further, with limited fatigue life data, we can calibrate to our minimum fatigue, our, our minimum life model, which can help predict actual fatigue life of materials as a function of loading scenarios and microstructure with far fewer experiments. There are a couple ways that we can generate the digital microstructures, which are inputs to this modeling approach. Some of my colleagues uh, at Questec work heavily on the process structure side, and Questec has a long history of CalPad modeling to help predict microstructure evolution, as well as uh, microstructure as a function of composition and thermal history. So using those approaches, we can generate digital twins uh, by predicting the microstructure, 
Um, alternatively, we can also generate digital twins by characterizing microstructures, or we can co combine the uh, two where you may characterize some features and predict others. Here you can see some examples where we used back electron backscatter diffraction, or EBSD, to characterize the brain morphology and orientation. In this case, in an adequately manufactured nickel alloy. We can also characterize the surface with a handful of different methods, of which uh, shown here, looking at both as-built and surface-finished conditions. Uh, and then finally, for inclusions and porosity, um, scanning electron microscopes uh, with EDS can be used to characterize these features. Once we have either predicted the uh, material microstructure statistics or characterized them experimentally, we use Dream 3D to generate digital twins for the microstructure, capturing all of these features. In the top right of this slide here, you can see an example of a histogram of brain sizes and crystallographic orientations. Uh, and below, you can see the resulting digital microstructures that we generate using the EBSD data from three perpendicular faces of a real 3D printed alloy. On the bottom left, you can see how uh, we can model surface roughness, porosity, and inclusions. Once we have generated a digital twin of the microstructure, we then need to calibrate to stress strain curves. Here we don't need a full fatigue experiment, but rather just a few loading cycles to get the st stable cyclic stress strain response that I mentioned before. And then we can calibrate our crystal plasticity model based on these cycles. This is a relatively quick process, and we already have developed crystal plasticity models for various different engineering alloys, capturing a lot of the common mechanisms for those alloys. So ultimately, we're just fine-tuning the parameters uh, to capture the specific stress strain response of a given material. Additionally, we can load these digital microstructures in any dimension with any complex loading state that we please. So we can adequately capture the anisotropic nature of additively manufactured materials. Here you can see our digital twin again, and clearly in the build direction, the grains look quite different than they do in the X, Y direction. This is typical in additive manufacturing because during the printing process, you get dendritic solidification, which causes long grains in the orientation of the build. As a result, we get different stress strain response in the Z or build direction than we do in the X, Y direction or perpendicular to the build, uh, which is captured in our stress strain curves here during calibration. Uh, so to summarize this fatigue workflow, we split fatigue into incubation, microstructurally small crack growth, and long crack growth, and we have different models to capture each of these stages. You can see a summary here on the different experimental techniques and the uh, models in the table on the left. And then on the right is the resulting outputs, a full stress strain curve, uh, and as well as uh, the full strain versus number of cycles of life for fatigue life as a function of process and composition and load environment. So next I'm gonna discuss how we use machine learning to enhance our physics-based modeling and simulation approach. So in the context of fatigue modeling, Questec uses machine learning to train reduced order surrogate models. This approach is especially useful when we are dealing with high fidelity simulation approaches, which are inherently computationally expensive. We use high fidelity simulations because they are faster and provide more insights beyond what you can see experimentally. However, they still take hours to days, so we are limited in the quantity of simulations we can run. As dimensionality increases, and there are more and more scenarios we want to look at with a model, machine learning can be an effective tool by training reduced order surrogate models using the results of high fidelity simulations to then get approximate predictions without needing to run as many simulations. In general, this is an approach to accelerate simulation workflows. A couple of examples include Gaussian process regression surrogate modeling for uncertainty quantification and propagation in fatigue workflows, as well as symbolic regression for microstructure sensitive fatigue modeling. On the right side of this slide here, you can see an example of a simplified demonstration for genetic programming based symbolic regression. This is an approach we're working on with the Hohalter group at the University of Utah. Essentially, this uses a process analogous to evolution to generate candidate equations to relate microstructure to fatigue performance 
and then crossbreeds these candidate equations until it finds the best possible equation uh, to generate deep predictions that are in line with the more computationally expensive simulation. One of the major advantages of this approach compared with other machine learning approaches is that it produces a symbolic equation rather than a black box model. This enables engineers to be in the loop and evaluate the quality of the model and if it is defensible from a physics perspective, which helps us to avoid making erroneous predictions when we apply this modeling approach. Here you can see an example of our overall fatigue modeling workflow, including the symbolic regression model. First, we characterize or predict microstructure statistics. We then generate digital twins and simulate ensembles of digital microstructures to identify hotspots for fatigue critical life. And characterize the statistics of these fatigue indicator parameters to compare various loading conditions or microstructures. We enhance this workflow with machine learning to build surrogate models to accelerate this whole process. Naturally, simulating microstructure is computationally expensive, but with machine learning, we can train models on the high fidelity simulation and then use those surrogate models to quickly explore the microstructure space. Finally, using this workflow, we predict fatigue performance as a function of microstructure. Next, we use a similar approach to propagate uncertainty through computation of expensive models. With Questech's accelerated insertion of materials approach, where we predict not just the nominal properties, but the entire distribution of properties, including minimum, uh, the minimum property that you would see in a qualification batch, given hundreds of samples with uncertainty in composition, processing, and specification ranges, we need to uh, propagate those uncertainties through our process structure and structure property models to adequately capture this. In order to propagate an entire histogram of samples through our fatigue model to predict our distribution of fatigue lives, we use Gaussian process regression models. This is especially beneficial for uncertainty quantification activities because Gaussian process models have built-in prediction of the additional uncertainty that they introduce when you use those to predict your outputs as opposed to the original model. Here at the top of this slide, you can see an example of a prior and posterior distribution, where the black line is the model uh, and how it predicts fatigue as a function of brain size. And the red points are the training data from the crystal plasticity simulations. You can see that the further you are from training data, the bigger the shaded area is, representing your uncertainty in predicting fatigue in those points. By using this approach, uh, we can predict the uncertainty both in the material itself, as well as the uncertainty in our model to better capture our minimum possible performance. Next, I'll talk about how this approach can be scaled so that we can use this to predict fatigue in real components. The reality of real engineering components and products is that the strain state is typically quite different and more complex than what we see in simple uniaxial fatigue experiments. Dating back to the 70s, Brown and Miller recognized this and devised an approach called the gamma plane to look at differing complex strain states and make a design tool for fatigue. On this figure on the top right of the slide, each point represents a different strain state, like uniaxial, equibiaxial, or torsion, and everything in between. By generating this figure with enough data points, we can interpolate between those strain states and determine the iso-life contours along which the strain states are equivalent from a fatigue life perspective. The challenge with this approach is it's extremely time consuming and expensive to run multi-axial fatigue tests and to generate the sheer volume of fatigue data one would need to generate this plot. Then factor in the variability in fatigue as a function of composition and processing, and it becomes pretty impractical to do this for every different combination. However, recently, with the fatigue simulation tools that I've been describing today, folks have been able to begin to apply the same methodology computationally, so that now by simulating various strain states, we can generate ISO FIP contours, which are basically a simulated measure of ISO fatigue life contours, uh, which can allow us to upscale this approach from specific microstructures and loading scenarios to entire component fatigue life. 
Here you can see an example of a component scale finite element method simulation to determine the stress and strain state of a gear, which is pretty typical. But by generating the gamma plane for the fatigue life as a function of, of the strain state, we can now graft that onto a component to predict the location specific fatigue. Additionally, we can extend to microstructure the small crack and long crack stages and key areas where we expect the fatigue to be the worst and capture the entire fatigue life of the component. Now I'm going to talk to you about some real use cases for this fatigue modeling framework. Questnet has used this type of fatigue modeling for real engineering applications. First, we'll look at printed titanium uh, alloys, which is a commonly used uh, alloy for a lot of different industries, including biomedical for hip replacements, uh, aerospace for turbofan blades and jet engines, and many others. Uh, in this case, we were investigating the effects of pore size on high cycle fatigue life in printed TI64. Uh, so what this figure shows on the x-axis is the fatigue indicator parameters that we predict from our modeling, and on the y-axis, the probability. So the four different colors represent four different microstructures or four different uh, scenarios with different porosity levels uh, and the cumulative distribution of the fatigue predicted uh, at different locations within those microstructures. What's interesting here is that further to the right is worse fatigue performance and further to the left is better fatigue performance. And clearly we see that as the largest pore in the TI64 increases, our performance gets worse with the 31 micron pores being the furthest to the right 25 microns being slightly further to the left. Uh, but most interesting here is that once you get down to around 8 microns, it actually overlaps with the scenario with no porosity. So what this tells us is that if you get your pore size small enough, the pores are no longer the main driving force for fatigue crack initiation, but rather they compete with other things, perhaps the crystallographic orientation or grain size or other features of the microstructure, uh, which tells us that for, from a design allowable perspective, we just need to inspect that our pore sizes are below that threshold. So this can enable us to make more efficient uh, and informed design allowables and inspection criteria. Next, this approach was applied to Questec's own Ferium C61 process design. This alloy is used in many demanding applications where high cycle fatigue life is critical, like helicopter gears. Here we characterized clusters of inclusions within a microstructure at a critical distance from the surface, then generate digital twins of this microstructure and include bonded and debonded inclusion clusters. And uh, based on the statistics of inclusions, we can predict the minimum fatigue lift. This approach was validated by looking at the critical fatigue limiting feature predicted by the simulation, which in this case was the debonded inclusions. And as a result of identifying these debonded inclusions as the fatigue limiting factor, we were able to predict a significant improvement in fatigue life if the part were to be hot isostatically pressed or hit to close those debonded voids. The results are shown here on the right side of the slide uh, in the unhipped barium where we saw an order of magnitude lower high cycle fatigue life performance compared with the, hip, the hipped components. The study validates the predictions of the fatigue model and highlights the utility of this approach to optimize process in order to optimize the microstructure for fatigue performance. So finally, I'm going to close by quickly discussing Questec's ICMD software platform and the fatigue, the fatigue simulation toolkit we are working on developing right now. So Questec has released a software as a service platform called ICMD where users can interface with the large database of uh, thermodynamics, kinetics, finite element engines, as well as calified engines, and ICMD models that Questec has developed over the years. And they can do this through a web browser, uh, offloading a lot of the computationally expensive simulation and uh, modeling into the cloud uh, where it doesn't need to sort of burden the user. Ultimately, the user just needs to set up inputs and track their jobs. Uh, submit those for simulation in SAS, and then ultimately you can uh, visualize the results on the front end. This platform um, has, gives access to many different materials, uh, as well as being computationally light and materials agnostic. Uh, 
This is a proven software, along with proven databases, models, and analytics that QuestTech has been using internally since 2021. And our flagship toolkit for this software is the Alloy Design Toolkit, which enables you to do uh, pretty much anything you'd want to do for alloy design, optimization, and qualification activities from an ICMB perspective. We also have the ability to do um, more simple CalFed calculations directly, and we'll, we're soon releasing an additive printability toolkit, which will enable you to generate processability maps for additive manufacturing, as well as a fatigue toolkit later this year, which we focused on much of the modeling that I talked about today. The software is commercially available for subscription now. Currently, the software incorporates nickel, iron, and aluminum databases and models, and we're working towards releasing titanium very soon. I won't get into the details of the Alloy Design Toolkit for today, uh, but in the interest of just focusing on fatigue, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the fatigue toolkit that we're working on for release later this year. So this toolkit, as its inputs, will take the far left column here, tensile properties, microstructure data, and loading scenarios. And then internally in, in the software, we've built in the crack initiation model I talked about, as well as Dream 3D to generate digital microstructures, crystal plasticity, finite element simulations, as well as automatic calibration for user data. And the outputs are cyclic stress strain results, as well as those fatigue indicator parameters that I talked about. And then ultimately, with a bit of additional calibration, uh, one can get to a uh, fatigue life curve as shown here. Uh, so this approach integrates CPFEM, and we're working on some of the surrogate modeling approaches that I talked about today uh, directly into the ICMD software, as well as the Dream 3D digital microstructure generation tool. Uh, and we're, in the future, we're working towards integrating this directly with the, the rest of our software to give a comprehensive ICME modeling framework, which, as I mentioned, is, is largely captured within our flagship Alloy Design Toolkit. Uh, and then by incorporating this framework, we're adding in a bit more um, high fidelity fatigue simulation capability. Uh, so that concludes my talk today, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate the um, the great uh, presentation today. And um, if you're ready for questions, we'll get started. Uh, I appreciate you sharing, um, you know, those demanding applications and those use cases. Um, so uh, there's a few questions that have come in. So let's get started. I want to make sure that Gary is ready to take questions, Gary. Sure. Yep. Excellent. Um, so again, appreciate you sharing, you know, why fatigue is important, you know, the basics of multi-stage fatigue theory uh, during the presentation and how this ICME modeling can be used to, you know, kind of approach the sensitive um, fatigue presentation. So thank you for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what materials um, has this been applied to? Sure. Yeah, so this, this particular approach um, has been applied, at least at Clustec, to many of the common engineering alloys, including uh, several different uh, nickel-based alloys, both solution heat-treated and precipitation strengthened, like nickel-based super alloys, uh, as well as uh, stainless steel in the FCC state, as, uh, as well as um, high-strength martensitic steel, uh, titanium alloys like Ti-6-4, um, and some common aerospace uh, high strength aluminum alloys. So it's been applied across a pretty wide spectrum of sort of common engineering alloys. Um, and given that we've covered a lot of the bases of sort of the mechanisms that are included in the model, I think it'd be pretty straightforward for us to expand to really any other um, engineering alloy that kind of has similar structure, either FCC, BCC, or HCP as uh, those alloys that we've already looked at. Thank you for sharing that. Um... We got another um, question. Could you could you comment on the maturity of the fatigue modeling tool shown? Um, you know, at the end you shared that, and you said it's kind of coming out in the future um, or soon. Um, so, if I have a IN seven eighteen or wasp alloy material, I hope I said that right. <laughs> can I use the IC ICMD platform to predict fatigue life under the different 
um, HT scenarios and how good are, are we with the accuracy? That was a mount. <laughs> you good with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say currently right now, Quest Tech uh, does service engagements where we are able to do just that. Basically, we would calibrate to a little bit of experimental data for either Wasp Alloy or Inc. and L719. We've actually worked with Inc. and L719 with this model specifically. Uh, and again, Wasp Alloy being similar mechanisms would be fairly straightforward. It'd just be a, a quick calibration to a couple of data points in terms of stress strain curves. Um, and then we could predict uh, with fairly high accuracy, but especially for high cycle fatigue, um, the numbers kind of would kind of vary depending on the calibration, but uh, you know, Historically, we've had the ability to pretty much match the SN curve um, for nickel alloys, nitide, as well as some other alloys. Um, in terms of the, the software itself, uh, the fatigue simulation toolkit is um, sort of aimed to release in Q4 of this year. Uh, and the initial functionality there will be um, allowing users to essentially run simulations with for sure martensitic steels. And we're hoping to have um, nickel and uh, titanium as well as aluminum available and then you, you would essentially upload your uh, stress strain curve and uh, there's tools built into the, the platform to calibrate um, sort of that baseline uh, crystal plasticity model to your specific alloy whether that's wasp alloy or nickel 718 or any other nickel alloy okay so stand by for q4 of this year um so thanks for sharing that and and sharing the um the alloys that it's going to be um, running off of. So it looks like another question came through. Uh, what software are you using for the CPFE calculations or the FIP determination? Yeah, so we um, we use, uh, when we're running these ourselves, we use a handful of different softwares for crystal plasticity. Uh, but within our, uh, what we've kind of made an effort to do is port over most of our um, simulations to Prisms Plasticity, which is a open source tool out of the University of Michigan. Uh, and the advantage with prisms is it was specifically designed uh, for sort of uh, massive parallelization. So it can scale up really well on uh, multiple uh, cores, like running on a, a larger computer. Um, and also being an open source tool, it's it's very easy to run it in the cloud without any sort of um, licensing issues or anything like that. So that's what we've built in sort of a, in the background in our software, which um, if you were to submit a simulation, it, it would run uh, an instantiation of prisms in a cloud uh, machine uh, but then again we can we can run it with really um, any finite element simulation software which uh, allows for user material subroutines right uh, thank you for that I'm sure um, that will be useful um, a couple other questions um, how does how does this differ from damage tolerance approaches and fracture mechanics? Sure, yeah, so um, the approach that we were mostly talking about here today was microstructure sensitive fatigue modeling. Um, so the big difference here is that sort of traditional approaches to fatigue um, have looked at mostly linear elastic fracture mechanics where um, you assume once the crack is above a certain length, essentially that the plastic zone at the end of the crack is averaging out enough grains that the microstructure locally is no longer sensitive and it's more of a like homogenous type of uh, property. Um, and, and this approach looks at that sort of before that occurs, before your crack is that long, mm -hmm. what's happening. And, and that's particularly important for high cycle fatigue for crack initiation. So damage tolerance approaches, you would typically look to see once your crack has reached a certain threshold, uh, and then you can predict how it will grow from that threshold to final failure. Um, but it doesn't give you much information about uh, sort of what happens up until that threshold. And I think I mentioned in the, the presentation a couple of times, but essentially, um, for high cycle fatigue in particular, most of the cycles for the life are sort of consumed in the time that it takes to just initiate the crack in the first grain and grow it through the first three to 10 grains, which we call microstructurally small crack growth. Uh, so in that time, um, we can capture it more explicitly with our modeling approach than would be done with true mechanics approaches. Thank you for that. Um, there's a Another question that came in, it says, can you ac access those workflows with Python? Um, so in general, uh, I mean, modeling can be done with Python. I think if, if it's in reference to the ICMD platform specifically, um, we will be 
working towards having an uh, API enabled for Python integration, but currently it's, it's mainly focused on a web-based user interface. However, the, the user interface has been explicitly sort of designed to limit the need for, basically you can do a lot of customization within the UI, like you can do batch calculations and other things that you would usually use an API to do. Um, we've been sort of working to reduce the need of um, sort of custom workflows. All right, thanks. Um, how manual is the setup? Yeah, so I think, um, again, we'll, we'll be releasing the fatigue simulation toolkit specifically later this year, but uh, we currently have a version kind of working internally, which is um, requires a fair amount of expertise to run it, but kind of the work that we're doing to get to the point of releasing it to end users is improving the sort of user friendliness aspect. So we're working actually right now on um, a solution to have sort of like a wizard that would help you set up your workflows and, and it should be uh, reasonably straightforward. We have a lot of documentation built into the existing toolkits like our Alley Design Toolkit where for every model that we have available you can see all the theory behind it as well as typical use cases, uh, references to literature where the theory is established as well as kind of listed out inputs and outputs and kind of gives you an understanding of what typical range those inputs should be uh, as well as in, in some cases recommended values for common use cases. So uh, we're, the idea behind the ICMD platform is really to democratize ICMD so you don't need to be kind of an expert in one specific niche field, but you can utilize all these tools um, and kind of learn on the fly as you're in the, in the software. So it sounds user friendly. Um, and with the with the data and the, and the knowledge that you want to have accessible to everyone. So that's great. Um, we've got another question here. Uh, some alloys and microstructural conditions don't cyclically stabilize or take hundreds of cycles to stabilize. What approach do you recommend for those materials? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we can actually simulate ratcheting behavior and model you use. So those are a little bit more niche, I would say. Um, but depending on what exactly you're looking at, um, there's a couple of options really. If you just want to look at the stable response ultimately you could simulate you could experimentally run say 100 cycles or a thousand cycles and then capture your cyclic strength strength curve after that point uh, and calibrate to that um, but alternatively uh, if you're actually interested in that behavior as to why it's not stable in those areas uh, that would be more of like a custom constitutive model development to explore that to look at ratcheting behavior or something along those lines great um, we, we've got a, a question coming in about additive um, in the fatigue modeling. So does your additive manufacturing fatigue model allow the user to study the impact of the process, laser um, powder hatching strategy, or does that have to determine, have to be determined experimentally and input in some fashion to the fatigue model? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, in general, the fatigue toolkit is, I would say, a structure property modeling tool uh, in the sense that it used the inputs for that model are your microstructure and your loading scenario, and then the outputs are the fatigue performance. So all of this sort of variation in process would affect the microstructure in terms of things like crane size, orientation, as well as defects like porosity. Um, and all of those, all of those relevant Microstructural attributes can be accounted for, um, but the fatigue toolkit itself would not be used to predict those inputs, the structure attributes. However, the alloy design toolkit, as well as our um, additive process ability mapping tool, both are more geared towards uh, process simulation, or at least alloy design is geared towards process structure and property. Um, so in, in those other tools, there's there's many ways that you could predict things like grain size, for example, which you could then um, output from your alloy design to a good job and then go over to your um, fatigue simulation to a good job and use that as your inputs for the fatigue simulation. All right. So how expensive is each 3D? One more question and it's 154. So we're coming up on the end. So for those that haven't had a chance to get a question answered, please make sure you put them in. Um, and those that didn't get them answered, um, Gary and the Quest Tech team will make sure that they, they reach out and, and follow up with you. Um, so uh, how expensive is each 3D CPFEM run? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a bit of an intricate question in the sense that there's a lot of variables that go into that. Um, but in general, I guess 
first on the actual cost side, the way that we're doing an ICMD, um, it is sort of like we would have built in workers, so it would run in the cloud, but there wouldn't be like an explicit um, sort of dollars cost to running these simulations uh, to the user. How, however, from a computational expense side, if that's more of the um, sort of orientation question, um, typically, we, depending on the size of the SVE, so our statistical volume elements can range anywhere from, say, 10 by 10 by 10 elements, uh, which would be a thousand elements. So, like a cube that's, you know, 10 um, spacings on each side, up to about 30 by 30 by 30, which would be 27,000 elements. Uh, and the cost of the simulation really scales uh, with the size of the statistical volume element, which is your finite element mesh, essentially. Um, as well as the number of slip systems. So if you're looking at like a BCC material, like a Martin steel, um, that will have 48 slip systems that are typically active versus FCC, something like a nickel-based super alloy would maybe only have 12 slip systems. So that's four times less computation there. Um, so in general, like those different variables will, will affect the size of the simulation, but for a ballpark estimate, if you're running on a single core, so you know, most laptops maybe have four to eight cores that you could run on, but running on a single core, a simulation is in the ballpark of an hour to two hours, uh, but because we're using uh, prisms, which is parallelized, you know, if you run on four cores, you could run it in maybe 15, 30 minutes per SVE, um, and then again, you can keep scaling that, so you can run it really as fast as you want to, and it scales quite well up to at least I think 128 cores that have been examined. Excellent. Seems comprehensive. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think that is going to wrap up for those questions that we have. Um, and what I want to uh, do is thank you. Um, obviously, you've shared great um, practical applications for this in the um, modeling industry or the modeling um, the use cases you shared, the comprehensiveness, where you're going with it. So I appreciate that. And and as as I said earlier, for those of you that um, did not get your your questions answered or have questions following this, um, the Questec team would be happy to reach out. You will be receiving a, an email thanking you for joining us today, as well as receiving um, a, a copy of the the video and the handouts as well for the presentation. So, Gary, I'd like to thank you and the Questec team. Um, for your presentation, your thought leadership, your membership at Lyft. Um, and I'd like to thank the attendees uh, for joining us today. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.